Hello everyone, Professor Berninger coming at you here. I'm going to talk a little bit about Edgar Allan Poe and we were going to discuss his short story, The Cask of Amontillado. So Poe really is a giant in American literature, really world literature. People all over the earth uh, read Poe in translation. Uh, for some reason the French absolutely adore him. Uh, they also love Jerry Lewis, which is a little odd. Um, but Poe really is a, a giant figure in American literature. Not only that, but he really captivates uh, a certain segment of popular culture uh, as well. Uh, many people are aware of, of sp especially the poem The Raven and his story The Telltale Heart. Um, the Raven has appeared on uh, the television show The Simpsons, Treehouse of Horrors, their annual Halloween uh, special. You can get a Poe Pez dispenser, Poe bobbleheads. Um, Poe has several historic sites and a museum uh, dedicated uh, to him. So he really is a, a, an icon uh, in American uh, literature. And he was very successful uh, in some ways uh, in his time. He really devoted his life to literature. Um, and uh, literary criticism. He wrote some of the best essays in, in American history about um, studying uh, literature and how to read literature. Uh, so it's definitely overblown that he was this, you know, madman, alcoholic, drug addicted. You know, you can't write these extremely well-crafted stories in poems, and particularly his very lucid, his very clear essays, if you're, you know, always drunk and a maniac. So, now Poe sort of played that up himself as part of his sort of image, right? And after he died, um, you know, Poe was not afraid to speak his mind and write his mind during his life, so he did make some enemies, and after he died, Mr. Uh, Griswold, the supposed friend of Poe's, really did a lot to denigrate uh, Poe's uh, reputation and the life uh, that, he, that he lived. But Poe plays a big part in the sort of mythology uh, of, of Edgar Allan um, Poe. But really, again, a, a giant figure in, uh, in, American, in uh, American storytelling. Poe invented the detective story. We didn't read it, but you can easily find it. The Purloined Letter invented the detective story, right? And from that flows Sherlock Holmes. From that flows uh, Law and Order. Every cop show, detective show on television, which you can't get away from them, right? You can find it five of them on at any time if you have all the cable channels. Um, so Poe invented the detective story. Um, that's, a, that's really, really, really remarkable. Um, so very good. So today we're going to dig into uh, The Cask of Amontillado, and it's a story that I really like, and it's very emblematic. A lot of post stories and poems do have the same theme. And the theme, the one we're focusing on, is that what drives us in our behavior and our thoughts comes from within us. We may convince ourselves that the motivation is external, but really, it's our own psychology that drives our perception. So Poe has lots of first-person narrators, right, um, who may or may not be mad, um, crazy, uh, in one way or another. Um, so Poe, very socio, a uh, psychological writer, our friend Nathaniel Hawthorne, a little bit more sociological, uh, looking at the uh, Puritans uh, as a, and people as a society, not so not so much getting inside somebody's head though. He he did enough of that, also. So the cask of Amontillado. So we'll just set this up and then we'll we'll play out uh, some of the scenes. We've got two main characters, really only two characters: Fortunato, the murder victim, and Montresor which is uh, translated, My Treasure, Fortunato, Fortune. Um, and the scene is Fortunato's um, sort of a underground cave, man-made cave, a catacomb, uh, leading to a storage place for wine, a cask of Amontillado. Now, 
not only was it perfect place for storing wine, but it's a perfect place to store the family bones. Uh, if you've ever been to Paris, I have not. You can go into the famous catacombs and see femurs and ribs and, sc and skulls uh, sort of stacked up. Um, in a big city like that, there's not a lot of room to bury people. And so families and some um, organizations would just stack the bones up. So I'm not really that interested in going to the catacombs, um, to tell you the truth, in Paris. So the scene is Montresor's basement, for lack of a better word, uh, the tunnels underneath his house. And the, in the first paragraph, I really want to spend some time on the first paragraph. The first paragraph is where Montresor clearly outlines whether or not his project will be successful. His criteria for success. It's not, do I kill the guy? It's not, do I leave him to die? His criteria for success is really quite specific. Let's look at it. And by the way, the main question we're going to answer here today is, why does Montresor kill Fortunato? I will tell you right off the bat, it has nothing to do with insults. The thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as best I could. But when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. Pretty vague there. Thousand injuries, insult. Come on. You, now I don't know who, who you is. You, who so well know the nature of my soul, will not suppose, however, that I gave utterance to a threat. So he never threatened him. At length, I would be avenged. This was a point definitively settled, but the very definitiveness with which it was resolved precluded the idea of risk. Okay, so I can't have any risk here. No risk. I must not only punish, but punish with impunity. So he's saying I must not only punish Fortunato, but I must not get punished myself. Solid, right? A wrong is unredressed when retribution overtakes its redresser. So if it comes back and you get punished, it, it's a fail, right? So. It is equally unredressed when the avenger fails to make himself felt as such to him who has done the wrong. So you have to know that uh, the person you're getting revenge against has to know that you are getting revenge against that person, right? So if you're mad at your neighbor and you light a bag of uh, dog poop on fire and leave it on the neighbor's porch and they come out and stomp it out um, but they don't know it's you who left it there um, then it's a fail fail of a revenge now I don't, maybe that isn't but according to For Montresor's criteria he must punish without getting punished back and the person he is getting revenge upon must know that that person is um, having revenge taken upon him. So two important uh, criteria there. Quick side note. When is this story being told in relationship to the events of the story? When is the story being told by our first person narrator? When is the story being told in relation to the events of the story? Anyone? Anyone? 50 years later. The murder takes place 50 years later. Now, how do I know? How does Berninger know that? Let's see, some sort of genius? Nah. second to last sentence in the story. For half a century, no mortal has disturbed them, the bones. So 50 years later, so these, he must be a young man, maybe 20 or 30, and he's an old man telling this story. Is he telling it on his deathbed? Is it a confession? Is it a deathbed boast? Why after 50 years is he revealing that he buried Fortunato alive in his uh, wine cellar family crypt? Buried him alive. Of course, a lot live burial comes up a lot in Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, in the mid 1800s, live burial was a legitimate fear. Okay, 
Um, we know, you know, if somebody was in a deep, deep coma, there was no really good stethoscope or, you know, uh, EKG thingy kind of thingy. Um, put a mirror under the nose. If it doesn't fog up, they must be dead. Let's bury them. Well, we know that people were buried alive because after they were exhumed, for whatever reason, cemeteries used to get moved, the inside of the casket would have been clawed upon and there'd be wood and fabric underneath the, the nails of the skeleton. Now, if you had enough money, if you had enough money, you could buy a casket with a tube that came went above ground for air and a little cord. And if you pulled the cord, a bell would ring or a flag would pop up. So you might be walking down the road uh, and you're like, oh, look, uh, the flag's up. Uh, Uncle Ernie's not dead after all. Hey, Sue, get a shovel. Let's dig him up. Let's see how he's doing under there. Um, so live burial was a possibility. Now Poe often returns to live burial as a, a device in his literature because it is a metaphor or symbol of being buried alive under our own psychological issues, under our own mental issues. Um, we are buried alive by our false, sometimes, perceptions of the world. We cannot go on with our life because of what is going on in here. So Poe uses this fairly uh, somewhat legitimate fear. I mean, it didn't happen every day, but the, a, a fear of being buried alive um, as a symbol that people would have recognized and understood um, as a mental state rather than necessarily a physical um, state. So. So they're walking, so just quickly here, we'll wrap up this segment. So Fortunato, uh, Montresor, Montresor is a mass, he understands psychology really well. How does he make sure that he doesn't have any servants in the house who might serve as witnesses? Anyone? He tells them he's headed out and that they better stay home, but he's headed out. Well, that's what we call reverse psychology, right? Hey, I'm not going to be around. I won't, you know, but you better stay here. And they're like, oh, I think we'll go out too. So he understands reverse psychology. And of course, he uses reverse psychology to get Fortunato to volunteer to go taste the Amontillado. Fortunato volunteers to go down into the catacomb to taste the Amontillado, volunteers essentially, as we find out, to go to his own death. Um, there are a couple slip-ups early on here. Um, Montresor says to Fortunato, um, you know, I got this Amontillado and uh, during carnival time here, I'm off to see Lucrezi to, to find out, you know, if it's real, you know, a connoisseur, someone who can taste wine and tell you uh, the type, uh, when it was grown, maybe even the year, what side of the hill the grapes were grown on. Um, so he doesn't even tell him, ask uh, Fortunato to go with him. He says, oh, I'm going to go get Lucrezi. And of course, Fortunato, uh, being a little arrogant, decides, oh, I'll go tell you. Now, there are some slip-ups here. Montresor says, I have my doubts. And I was silly enough to pay the full Amontillado price without consulting you in the matter. You were not to be found, and I was fearful of losing a bargain. Now, I'm a pretty savvy shopper most of the time. Paying full price is not a bargain, right? Paying full price is not a bargain. But uh, uh, Fortunato is a little drunk, so he doesn't really notice this stuff. So... So he says, oh, Montiato, I have my doubts. Montiato, as you are engaged, I'm on my way to Lucrezi. He has a critical turn. He'll tell me, oh, Lucrezi can't tell Montiato from Sherry. And yet some folks will have it that his taste is a match for yours. Montresor is good. Come, let us go with her to your vaults. My friend, no, I will not impose on you. And of course, inside his head, Montresor is like, got him. He volunteered to go down to his own death. So we will end this segment here. We will move on to our further discussion of the cask of Amontillado.